We return to Magic Origins in the next set, not to be confused with the set called Magic Origins, which actually has nothing to do with the origins of Magic, we're travelling back to Dominaria. You see, years before we jumped from plane to plane to plane to plane to plane, the majority of Magic storyline took place on a huge plane called Dominaria. It's where the stories of Urza, Mishra, Sarah and other notorious characters took place. But when we left to travel the multiverse, we didn't really return. We had a brief stint in the past, present, future and alternate dimension Dominaria in the time trial block of 2006, but we haven't been on Dominaria since 2003's Scourge. It's been a long time, kids, and the words of Jack from Lost. We have to go back. We have to go back! So yeah, I'm hyped, and to add to that hype, I've even got this cool Dominaria t-shirt that the guys over at Zavi gave me. Um, it's got a car and a Teferi on it. It's like old school magic. But even more exciting than that, Wizard of the Coast has sent me something nice as well. Not really, that's an egg. What was inside it? Mmm. Mmm. I love the chocolate. It came to eggs. Mmm. Ah. Genuinely not making that up. I think I went down the wrong hole. But I got a little sidewalk toy. Oh. Be right back, I need a drink. <coughs> oh, that is better. What was meant to be a little side back almost like Kinder eggs. Just turned into a Oh, I almost died. Anyway, that's not really what Wizards of the Coast sent me. They're nothing to do with Kinder Egg. As a disclosure. What they did send me though was far more exciting. <sighs> yeah, look at that! The Dominaria pre-release kit, that was literally magic. In case you don't know who I am, I'm Vince, also known as Peasant Kenobi on the internet. And I won't be swearing at all today, I'll be on my best behaviour. I might wink and shake my eyebrows in a rather suggestive way instead. Wizards have been a little bit apprehensive to send me products in the past, namely because Dan, who works as the community manager for Wizards Europe, is scared of the latent magical energy inside this beard. Whilst there are other grand wizards like Seth, Probably better known as Saffron Olive, who have slightly more majestic and grander beards than I do. Mine is sculpted. It is it is tight. It is like a like a tiger or some compact abs on the on the flat stomach of a Zac Efron. So now that I've got one of these, I'm going to be opening it today and seeing what we get and giving you guys at home a look at what you'll get in the new set, which should include a dice, some promos, some packs with some cards in that you can then make a deck from to play at your local pre-release. If you're not aware of what a pre-release is, it's an event that prior to the release of the set, you can go along and get one of these lovely packs to make a deck from. Once you've constructed said deck, you play against other people to show off how grand a wizard you are, and then you will get some boosts at the end of it if you do well, and if not, you might get some consolation boosts. Who cares? It's super fun, it's not competitive. I recommend it to everyone. I used to be a die-hard, die-hard pre-release fan. I used to every single one I could. I did four in some weekends because I loved it so much. I moved away from it a little bit simply because I moved away from the stores that I used to go to a lot. I started playing a lot more online. I started making content, which is also time consuming. But I'm so hyped for Dominaria. This isn't just because of the, the, the product hype. I generally cannot wait to go back to the original set of Magic. It's so nostalgic see the weatherlight and squee and all those characters come back. So I'm actually doing two pre-releases this weekend in one day. I just haven't decided where to do them yet. We're just a base or maybe even Portsmouth, depending on what me and John decide to do. On that topic, Wizards actually sent me two of these packs, which means we have two potential decks to make. Or plenty more than that. You can kind of make more than one deck sometimes. Either way, I'm going to open my pack today and talk about what I'm going to build, maybe, seeing how easy the pool is to build. And tomorrow I'm dropping this to John the Baptist's house. I'm going to sit and stare at him until he builds a deck. And I'm going to force him to play a game on camera. So in order not to miss that, don't forget to subscribe to the channel down below. Hit the bell icon to get notifications in future. That way you won't miss me and John playing the first Pleasant Kenobi pre-pre-release on the channel. Well, without further ado, let's jump into it. Let's, that's kind of a do actually. I shouldn't really say without further ado if I'm going to actually do stuff like that. Right kids, let's jump straight into it. I've got a lovely Thalia playmat here to pay some respects to the history of magic and how great legendary creatures are. So I think a legendary creature mat makes sense, right? The other option was Geist or maybe one of the Chandra mats. Um, but that's nowhere near as cool as our beloved Thalia, the guardian of fair decks. So I have a Dominaria pre-release kit. So you get one of these at pre-release. Pre-releases in England cost typically around £25, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on price support from the individual store itself. 
There will always be time to allow you to build your deck and you can always ask questions of those around you. Remember the main thing about pre-release is it's not very competitive, it's designed for you to go along, get hyped about the new set and have some fun. So don't get bogged down with being afraid of sounding like a silly billy because it just doesn't matter when it comes to pre-releases, that's what they're there for. They're there for everyone to learn and enjoy the new set. So we have a sweet looking box as always. The thing about these boxes are that they are not very practical for actually showing anything other than loose cards in. You're not going to put your promos and your rares in here because they'll knock about and get damaged. You're not going to fit a deck in here because they won't fit a deck with sleeves. Then what we should have is six packs of Dominaria. So let's pull those out. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six packs of Dominaria, all with fanciful like, headline cards on the front, like Khan Teferi, I think that is. And... The legendary bird guy that brings things back from the bin, kind of like Sun Titan. Uh, that's the new Sarah uh, Bane Slayer Angel thingy, I think. And that is Jaya Ballard, who was once a young lady but is now aged. And then we have one life counter. What colour life counter did we get? We got a red one. They vary in colour. I've seen that um, Digital Armor went and got a white one in his. I can't remember what colour the Life Into 20 got, but we got a nice little red one. Um, and then we get our promo. So normally at pre-releases, you get a little divider here as well, we'll go for that in a second. At pre-releases, in the past you've got one promo, for those of us that are watching this video that have been to pre-releases. This time I'm doing two promos. One legendary, which is guaranteed to be legendary, which can be the uncommon, so you can get a foil date stamp uncommon for that. So that's pretty cool, because it'll be very unique. In addition to that, you get one promo rare on Mythic, which can also be legendary. So we have a deck dividery thing for this box that isn't actually all that useful. We have promos, I'm going to bear with this, you can't quite see what they are yet. I don't want to ruin the surprises. This little handout here has uh, a showcase of the beautiful art from the t-shirt and the box and everything. They are really overusing this art perhaps, but that's the same with all booster box art, let's say. We've got Khan, Teferi and Jehoira there, highlighting the legendary theme of the set. And then we've got a lot of stuff telling you how to build a deck, which is kind of qu quite typical stuff that you should know if you've been to events before. But if you're new to pre-releases, this is actually very handy. It tells you your creature count. The other spells you should have alongside those creatures, uh, it tells you about curving your mana. So uh, it's like one drops, you don't really want one drops unless that's too powerful, so I'll come to that more in a moment. But two drops, three drops, four drops, five drops, and six drops, and seven drops, and eight drops. In a curve, more on this side, less on that side, so that you can actually curve out and play your spells on curve, or on the correct turns, which then allows you to actually get a good tempo to kill your opponent. It tells you how many lands you should have as well. So it's actually quite a good little guide if you are new to building limited decks. You've got a 40 card deck, uh, 40 card minimum, you can build more but you tend to not want to do that because you want to see your good cards more. So playing a deck that's more than 40 cards means you're less likely to, pl to pull that bomb planeswalker. When I say bomb, if that's a new term for you because you're new to the channel or new to magic in general, bomb is a card that is very, very good and when you play it, it probably wins the game if the opponent can't answer it. So without further ado, let's look at our promo. So we have got a Varix Blade Wing. That's what I can see through the pack. Interesting that they're transparent packs, really, because that probably stops their resale value in many ways. So Varix Blade Wing is a four mana mythic. So we've got a mythic, yeah, a mythic. Oh, the glare is the glare is real in this room. I want to play. I want to record natural sunlight, but working a day job stopped me from doing that. Such as the woes of a content creator. So it's a 4 4 4 4 with flying. It also has a kick cost of 3, which you can pay. So that means you can pay 7 mana total if you want to. Which means that when it ends the battlefield, you make another 4 4 uh, dragon token that is also legendary. It's Karox. It must be Verix and Karox are the original Blade Wing uh, from the original Naro sets. This is the, his children or, or progeny or, or grandchildren or something. So it's, it's playing on the whole legendary thing. So that's kind of cool. It's a 4 4 4 4 that can be a 7 mana, 7 power and toughness for 2 bodies. And then we've got Jaya. Jay is immolating in Jay is immolating Inferno. So which one of these is the legendary promo? I do not know because they're both legendary. Both red though, so that might be that we're playing red in our pre-release pool. And Jay's Immolating Inferno is a legendary sorcery that is red, red X. And Jay's Immolating Inferno does X damage to each of up to three targets. So it is a um, fireball effect, which is very, very, very strong and limited if you're not aware of that. Uh, but you can only play it because it's a legendary source, which is a new thing for this set, if you control a legendary creature or a planeswalker. However, it hits three targets, so you can kill two creatures and shoot their face. Or until a giant, I believe you can shoot both heads. So you can actually shoot them for double the damage with that. So until a giant, this card is ridiculous. So you've got two bomby red spells, which means you're probably going to end up in red as our colour. So let's put some stuff to the side and figure out how to open these packs without making an absolute mess of my computer desk. Okay. Pack number one. Oh, my dog is... Heard something, he just ran down the hallway. 
pack on board. So usually when I open packs, I like to go straight to the source, to the rare. We're not going to do that today. We're going to go through what we've got. So we have got a Soul Salvage, which is basically a card that returns creatures from the cards from the grid to your hand, which isn't all that great. We've got Befuddle, which is a common, uh, typical uh, combat trick, which depowers the enemy creature after it's blocked. Kill it, you get to draw a card. So it's, it's, it's playable, but it's not exciting. Charge, which is interesting, it's a one mana uh, temporary anthem for creatures, so this is actually quite good and aggressive deck, I'd imagine. Uh, Bloodstone Goblin, which is a two mana 2-2 two, two. whenever you cast a spell, if that spell has it was kicked, it gets plus one plus one and medicine to end of turn. So if there's a kicker archetype in the format, then this might be uh, one of the cards that puts that deck together in draft, perhaps, probably less so in, in seal, but I guess you do get more cards, so perhaps you can build the archetype better. With the seal pool, what do I know? I'm nowhere near being a limited expert here. We have a rather unexciting 3-2 for 3, which is an elf that can filter mana into other colours. Cabal Evangel is a 2-2 two, two for 2, which is a human cleric, so it's just a black bear. You have a minor shepherd. Now, when it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one green tapping token. So this is a really cool common sort of blade splice 2 for 1 body effect, where you get a 2-2 a two, two, and a 1-1. One, one. 3 power across 2 bodies. Quite typically, spreading power across 2 bodies is better than having it on 1, because it makes it harder to deal with with removal. We've got a Voltaic Servant, which is the 1-3, with the beginning of your end step, untapped target artifact. Um, I don't know how good this is. I don't know how many good tackle artifacts are in the set, if that's an archetype, perhaps. Let's put it to the side there. Blink of an Eye, which is a uh, two mana spell that's returned to a permanent in its hand. And if it was kicked, which is another two mana, it draws a card. This is into the Royal, but with some really fantastically bizarre art, where this Minotaur is turning blood of ice. And we all know on this channel how much we love mono blue Minotaurs. Toot toot. Shivan Fire is a one mana, two damage target creature. If it was kicked, it does four damage instead. Kick is four. This is quite good. It's kind of reminiscent of um, Burst Lightning, but it's not as good as Burst Lightning because it doesn't hit face. But this could be a card that you see play in standard. I've got another... Oh, no, I haven't got the same one, so it's a different thing. Whenever it attacks or blocks, these player draws a card. Wow, it's like a Temple Bell on a 2-3 body. That is... That is interesting. Howling Golem, a reference to Howling Mine, lots of references back to old stuff. Now, Skizix, I believe, unless this is a slightly different version, this car was literally a rare at one point. A 5-3 Trample Haster for 4. At the beginning of the instant, you sacrifice it, um, or you can pay it for 5 and not sacrifice it. So this card is actually pretty strong, especially if you get to kicker it. Uh, this card, a very, very aggressive red uncommon there. Then we've got our first uncommon legendary, which is Adela's The Cinderwind. It's flying, it's got haste. Whenever you cast an instance to sorcery spell, all wizards you control get pumped, so it's got like a weird like prowess for all the wizards in play. This card is legit. If there's a wizards deck in standard, this deck will probably be a key part of it, although I don't know if wizards have currently got the support they need to be good. And then we've got, ooh, a Gilded Lotus, and a really sweet sapling token. Look at his bushy little beard there and his tentacly arms. He's got like a head that's made out of coral. So cool. The Guild of is a pretty cool uh, like EDH staple. Might be part of a stormy like deck in 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 modern. I'm uh, sorry, in standard. It might be like a um, Paradox Engine Aether Thwar. There might be a Paradox Engine Aether Flux a Reservoir deck with Guild of Lotuses, perhaps. One man can dream. Right, let's hit the next pack a little bit quicker than the last one. Ooh, throw that stuff on the floor. So we have Arbor Armor, which is a one mana instant that puts a counter on target creature, and that creature gains reach. So it's a combat trick that can shoot down flyers. Uh, we've got a kicker, one, three for two, and when it's kicked, it ends the battlefield. If it was kicked, it your opponent discards two cards. So it's got a mind rot stapled to a human wizard body. Importantly, the creature types in this, in this format do matter, so wizard might actually help for some sort of Grixis who is a deck, but I don't think you want to three colors in. Limited if you can help it because it's much better. Unwind is counter attack, on creature spell, and on top of the three lands for three mana. So it's like a, a weird version of Rewind. Rewind used to be counter any spell for four mana, I believe. This is the essence scatter variant of that. It could be good. It could be good in Drogo Control in, in standard. Uh, we've got uh, Excavation Elephant, which is a five mana three five, but has kicker two. And when it enters the battlefield, if it was kicked, return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. Um. Yeah, I guess it can bring back Godfarer's Gift. Uh, it's got quite impressive stats for a limit, I guess. A 3-5 will probably chump block... Uh, sorry, a 3-5 will probably stonewall the majority of the creatures we've seen so far. So, so maybe, just maybe, Excavation Elevator... Uh, excavation Elevator... 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 Elephant might just get us there. We've got... John the Baptist is excited about this card for, for Mono Red Tron, potentially in 
uh, Pauper. This is a 2 mana 1 3, which when kicked for 4 mana red and 3, allows you to return target instant sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. That is a human wizard, so again, it is relevant for limited. Um, Pierce of the Sky is 7 damage target creature with flying. It's 2 mana instant, sort of almost like a Doom Blade for flyers. Some of the flyers in this format, in the limited, uh, the, the, the rares and, and, and mythics seem absolutely filthy. So this card is probably a much needed sideboard card when you see your opponents flying bombs. Uh, we've got a 1 1 short sword that. We've got a 1-1 one, one buff on a short sword for 1, which equips for 1. It's 1-1-1. One, one, one. Very easy to remember. Another Shiv and Fire, which is probably... To be fair, this is probably the premium removal, so if we're opening this pool to make a deck, I'm probably going to be in red at this point, because I've got the two red bombs, and I've already opened up two Invert Commons premium red removal spells. Uh, we'll see where we go with a few more packs, though. We've got this thing, which is a Cat Warrior. Oh, okay, I thought it was like a... I thought it was like a, um, a drake, but actually the cat warrior is riding this thing to flying 3-2, and when it enters the battlefield, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard and you gain three life. Uh, I don't know if self mill is a thing in this format. I can't remember what cards I've seen in the mythic spoiler that really would want that sort of effect, but uh, maybe it'll help reanimate her in standard, um, but at five mana I probably wouldn't play it. Ancient Animus is two mana to put a plus one plus one cat target creature you control. If it's legendary, then it fights a target creature and opponent controls. So you put a counter on it, Oh, so, so it fights regardless, the counter is only if it's legendary. That's how that works. It took me a little while to read that two or three times to actually get the, the full idea. Got Memorial to Folly, which there's a whole chain of these, a whole cycle, should we say, with some really cool art that throws back to, to the deeds of past heroes. And this one returns a creature card from the graveyard to, to, to your hand. Untamed Cavalry was a card that I might actually play in Legacy at some point in a deck that I want to play called Bear Force Chalice on 1, which is uh, it's a bear. It's a 2 2. For two that has Vigilance and Trample, and if kicked for an extra three, it gets three extra counters. So it's a five mana, five five with Vigilance and Trample. It's basically a very versatile bear, so it fits the, the, the flavorful joke that you can play anything alongside a Chalice of the Void and a Trinosphere and win the game. So let's put that there. Oh, Slimefoot. So this is a cup I want to actually try in Brawl or Commander. He is a three mana, two three. Whenever it... Uh, 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 Whenever Sapling you control dies, Slimefoot Stairway deals 1 damage to each opponent and what you gain 1 life, and 4 mana you can make a 1 1 Sapling. So Sapling Tribal could be really fun in Brawl perhaps. It also seems to fit into some sort of Aristocrats deck if you're second Sapling for, for sheer value. And then we've got a 4 barrel Blade, which is a 3 mana plus 3 plus 0 Vigilance and Trample equipment. And when a creature dies, attach this to target creature you control. So it moves around as the creature dies. This seems quite good and limited for an equipment because you don't have to keep repaying its costs. I've got another Sapling. This one appears to be on the Weatherlight. So this one appears to be the token made by Slimefoot himself. Okay, Slimefoot, if you read the flavor text, as Jora restored the Weatherlight, a mushroom growing in the hold unexpectedly became a first crew member. So somehow a mushroom grew and became sentient, became a fungus like sort of like Lord character uh, over the time. Remember that Joyra is like a time wizard, uh, like, like kind of like a Doctor Who style character. Um, so she might have been manipulating the time streams, which might have inadvertently grown this mushroom much quicker than she should have done. The silly old mare. Right, let's put some cards to the side. What rare did we get there? Was it the blade? I'm going to put the blade. I'm going to put our rares over there so we see what our bombs might be. I want to play around him as well, but I don't think I'd build that so far out of my pool because we've only opened two sapling cards. Right. Put this to the side. For those who don't know the tokens that I'm opening, these things at the back. Oh, look at the saplings in this set. They're beautiful. That one looks like a, like something out of Fantasia, but with like sort of like weird naughty tentacles that I won't use the word because I'm not sure if I'll get told off for it. Let's put that over there. It's a naughty saproling. Right, okay, so we've got a Gitty Journey Mage, which is a 3 mana 3 2 that ends the control of the wizard, deal 2 damage to each opponent. So until the giant, this is wicked because it does 4 damage. But other than that, it's just a man serving a very hot pizza. So a man, is it a lady? I think it's a man serving a hot pizza on a tray. Here's Gitu. Pizza Mage. Right, we've got a Lanoir Scout, which is a 1-3 that can tap to put a land from your hand into a battlefield, which is basically like the snakes from Kamigawa. Another similarity this has with Kamigawa, a legendary theme. Drudge Sentinel is just a bad Drudge Skeletons, but you can't play Drudge Skeletons in the format, so this guy will have to do. He's a 2-1-3 for three that you can tap 3 mana and regenerate him in some sort of weird, mangled version of Regenerate, where he gains his destruction becomes tapped. It's bizarre. Rescue, turn target opponent, you control it's only hand for one mana. I think that's a reprint. I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think it's very good. Um, Sarah's Disciple, two mana, one, one, flying, burst strike. Oh, wow, okay. Whenever you cast a historic spell, Sarah's Disciple is plus one, plus one, until end of turn. I don't think that's very good, actually. I was just thinking that the a two mana, one, one f f seems bad, but when you stick two stat lines on it at common, it seems okay. 
Uh, if there's enough auras and equipment, it might be good, but other than that, probably not. Another uh, kicker uh, gain menacy dude. Another uh, into the royal with cooler art. And then we've got a skittering surveyor. A skittering surveyor ends the battlefield. You may search your library for a basic land card, reveal that, and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Okay, so it's just like um, Pilgrim's Eye, but on a 1 2 body on the floor. Exciting stuff. Gift of Growth is a two mana pump for two, but if it was kicked, it gets plus four, plus four. Four mana for four is pretty good. The art's cool. It's got like a big stag like running out of a forest. It's cool. Fiery Intervention. Choose one. Fire damage target creature or destroy target artifact. Oh, it's like a, like a bigger abrade at sorcery speed. Um, I don't think that was good necessarily, but it's Chandra f like getting involved with a fight between a, like a golem and a, and a tree, folks. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's versatile and limited, so maybe that is good enough. Warcry Phoenix, 4 mana 2-2 two, two with flying and haste, whenever you attack with 3 or more creatures you may pay 3, if you do return Warcry Phoenix from the graveyard to the battlefield attack and attack it. Oh wow, so it's got like a, a weird battle cry returning, but that seems quite good for limited as well because if it dies it's probably coming back eventually. Uh, we've got our first saga, Triumph of Gerard, put a plus 1 plus 1 count on target creatures you control with the greatest power, so it basically bestows. Not bestows, that's not even the term, that's the wrong mechanic, it bolsters each time. So if you don't know, how sagas work is they enter and so when it enters the battlefield you trigger it once, after you draw something you trigger it again, and then you draw, trigger it on your next draw step again. Um, every time you add a law count you trigger this so you have a plus one plus one count on target creature you control with the greatest power twice, and the third one target creature you control with the greatest power gains flying, first strike and life thing until end of turn, which is pretty good, that's a lot of, a lot of words there. Two mana, I'll probably play this, it seems good enough. Uh, Danithia Capuchin Paragon. So it's like one of the grandkids or great grandkids of Gerard, the original big white soldier dude who hung out on the weatherlight, was seen on the ensnaring bridge and fought in the Phyrexian arena. She has first strike, life link, and vigilance. She's a three mana two two. Those seem like some good keywords for limited. Or an equipment cards spells that we cast cost one less to cast. Wow. And then we've got Oath to Fairy. Um so it ends the battlefield exile another time with permanent you control returns and Oh, boob, 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 talking is hard today. When Oath of Teferi enters the battlefield, exile another target permanent you control, return to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the end step. So it flicker wisps things, guys, which if you haven't heard, is one of the best effects in Magic. There's not a problem with the game, it cannot solve. It also says you may activate the loyalty abilities of Plenty of Control twice each turn rather than only once. That is nuts. That is a nuts second line. I mean, it's a five mana enchantment, it's also legendary, so playing multiples of the match isn't so good, apart from the flicker effect, I guess. I, I, it's going to be a Commando All-Star, right? I do want to play with that card. Activating Plague Walkers twice a turn seems like a way to generate a lot of value very quickly. Let's move some of this nonsense to the side. We didn't get a sapling token. I thought we were on a home run of all saplings, but we didn't get one that time around. Or did we? Is that the pack that I threw the sapling over there for? I think we did. I think we three saplings. Ignore me. Right, fourth pack. Can we get another sapling? Oh, it's a goblin, but it's a really wicked goblin. It's like a Mad Max goggles inside a catapult with spiky... Oh, God, it's so cool. The goblins in this set are wicked. I mean, I'd probably still play the old art ones anyway. But God, that's so cool. Right, we got the event, Trapper. That's my attempt to speak in French, by the way. I do apologise. Whenever you cast an historic spell, tap top creature opponent controls. It's not quite a good ability if you've got an historic deck. Get to Love Mancer, as long as you control two or more instant sorcery cards in your graveyard, as long as you control. As long as there are two or more in the graveyard, not controlling, that would be stupid. It gets plus one, plus zero, and haste, so it's possibly a one mana two two if you turn into the game. I wouldn't play it in limited, but maybe it'll find a home in the human's wizard's deck in, in standard. We've got another Lanoag dude that converts mana. We've got a vest, which I think is going to be quite playable in construction, maybe even making its way into other formats other than standard. Total player reveals is on hand. You may choose an artifact or creature card format, that player discards that card. This is relevant because a lot of creatures are legendary and obviously artifacts are also historic, so you're hitting two historic spells types there. Our uh, opt, our first going opt with the new Teferi art, which is really cool. It's Teferi looking at some sort of artifact in the present with a statue of him in the past holding another one. It's just a cool little throwback. We've got our next and only so far, other than uh, Slimefoot, card makes Sapmans, I think. When it dies, create a 1 1 sapling. It is Death Bloom Thalid. I really like the, oh, the Thalid arts are great. This seems so. This seems more Last of Us than the, than the Thalids ever used to see. I like well, they, these might even be creatures that the fungus have grown onto, or at least grown to imitate the shape of. A bit like in that film Annihilation, if you've seen it, which I recommend. The film's great. Uh, Rampaging Cyclops is a 4 4 for 4, and it's minus 2 minus 0 as long as you have two or more creatures that are blocking it. So it can get group blocked down very easily. I think the card's probably quite bad. A 2-2 two, two for 2 with lifelink. There's a lot of bears with keywords strapped onto them in this format. 
Uh, another dude that untaps dudes, that doesn't seem great. Get his blessing, seems like a cool cyborg card for standard at the moment. So Gaze Blessing might be a good cyborg card for standard. The problem is it doesn't really deal with Scourgog because it's sorcery speed and you can't cast it um, after it dies in their turn, only in your turn. But Titan Clash have up the three cards from the graveyard into their library and then you draw a card so it replaces itself. Also, once it's put the graveyard from your library, shuffle your graveyard into your library. So it actually it's anti-mill tech as well. It's an interesting card. Um, it, it's hateful in two different ways. I'm glad that Wizards are printing like sort of more pinpoint hate into the format like this and that new dampening stone which I haven't opened one of yet to try and uh, give us the tools to fight stuff, especially in modern. Some of these cards will bleed through into modern and hopefully still the format down. Um, not If Malice is the new uh, Black Knight. Uh, two, two with First Strike. Hexproof from white, which is an awkward replacement for protection from white ever, but I get why they're doing it. Has plus one, plus zero, as long as any player controls a white permanent. Uh, so you can play in a black white deck and be fine. We've got Sisei's sort of descendant now, this is Shana. Uh, she has plus one, plus one for each creature you control, and she has Shroud. Ooh, Territorial Alistair, so we've got a Dino. Wow. A four mana, five, five, which when it ends the battlefield, if it was kicked, it fights another creature, it's three mana to kick it. So it's a four mana, five, five, it's ahead of the curve. I thought, oh, it's a seven mana, five, five, that fights someone in the battlefield. Reminiscent of Pelucranos, I guess, apart from the mana has to be dumped in the same turn, not like Pelucranos that can sit there and dump the mana later. Um, nowhere near as good as Pelucranos. This is almost feels uncommon. Obviously, it's absurdly good. So, I mean, you don't want many, many of these in the limited pool, but as far as Instructor's concerned, it feels a bit uncommon because it doesn't feel that complicated if you look at the other kick cards that are in the set. Right. What have we here, then? So we've had no Planeswalkers, no Mythics in our packs yet, I don't think. What rare did we have in the last one? I forget. Okay, two more packs to go. I mean, we have got two, one mythic in our in our thing, so we can't remain too much. We've got a cleric token. Rob's gonna gush about that, isn't he? Oh god, look at it. he's holding like a. If that's got like a weapon with candles on the end of it. That's actually pretty funny. It might just be on eight, you know, for like ceremony and stuff. But it'd be funny if he's using it like a sort of candle spear. Uh, Unwind, you've seen already. Adamant Will has some really cool art. It's like a sword being shattered. It's a stained glass shield. I do think this woman looks a bit goofy though. She's like, aha, surprise. Uh, target creatures plus what? Target creatures plus two plus two and gains indestructible in ten of turns. Quite a good combat trick. Warlord's Fury gives something first strike and then you draw a card. That's a very average, if not poor, combat trick. I think maybe I'm misevaluating it. Let me know in the comment section below. Man of Spider is a sort of throwback to Giant Spider. It's a five mana three five reacher as opposed to four mana two four. I think Giant Spider is. Stronghold Confessor is a one mana one one that when kicked for an extra three, it has menace already. By the way, guys, they're loading up the keywords on the, on the otherwise normally vanilla creatures. If Stronghold Confessor it was kicked, it ends the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it, so it can be a four mana three three with menace, which is probably quite good, quite aggressive, good rate. I guess in the aggressive deck in the format and in drafting the mid, a one one with menace might be okay on turn one. But at least the fact that it's got two modes makes it much more versatile. Obviously, and much better. We have a Cold Water Snapper. It's a 4-5 for 6 mana. It has Hexproof. So you aren't killing that in any way other than combat. And a 4-5, as we said before, is probably quite a considerable body. The art is great as well. We've got the typical magic art. Four back of birds for scale. Don't worry, guys. I didn't just let out wind, by the way. I just dropped my leg on the leather chair. Power Stone Shard. The first part of the standard legal Tron. This basically produces more and more mana than more Power Stone Shards you have. We've opened one. In limited, don't forget, you can play more than four copies of a card if you open more than four copies. Ancient Animus is that fight thing again. That's confusing to read. Gideon's Reproach, because of course all the Gatewatch have to be in the set, otherwise um, somebody at Wizards would spontaneously combust. Uh, Ancient Speed for two mana. Gideon's Reproach deals four damage target attack on a blocking creature. I think this is a reprint, actually. I think we've seen it before. But that's a sick... Uh, removal spell, to be fair. Um, I think it was in Amonkhet. Was it in, was it in Kaladesh? I've played this recently. I can't remember where, though. Guardians of Koilos is a 5 mana 4 4. And when it ends the battlefield, you may return another target and start opponent you control to its owner's hand. I'll just do some cool ETB effects. We've got this. This is my favourite art in the set. That wall, the Amarinthian wall. Amarinth. Amar... Amarthine? Amarinthian? Amarinthian? Maybe I got it right the first time. Wall. God, my pronunciation is terrible. Zero Six Defender that can gain indestructible for two extra mana. Basically, the reason I like it is it seems so, like, the art is so monolithic. It seems like it's this ideal countryside dominaria, and we've got this, like, bizarre alien monolith almost. Uh, I assume from times gone by, I'm hoping it's not Eldrazi or Phyrexian. Well, it could be Phyrexian or I guess. Dominaria is, is dot that sort of stuff. Fight with Fire, so we've got a Fight with Fire. It deals Fire with a creature. If the spell's kicked, it deals 10 damage to as you choose among any number of target creatures instead. 
That seems really good in limited. Three mana for final damage to a creature, or you can kick it. Is that eight, quick maths? Nine mana, ten damage. It's kind of Urza's Rage. Kind of like that. Sentinel of the Pearl Trident is a three three five mana flash merfolk. Uh, referencing the Merfolk of the Pearl Trident, which was a common staple, uh, not staple, staple of lives, never really seen that much play, but it was in uh, old Dominaria sets. When Sentinel of the Pearl Trident enters the battlefield, you may exile target historic permanent you control. If you do, return that card to the battlefield from your owner's control, beginning the end step. Wow, we've got like, a historic Flicker Wisp effect on a 5 mana 3 3 flash Sentinel. I might play that card. That card seems sick. Anyway, that's weird to say about Merfolk. Grand Warlord Rada, haste 3 4. When one or more creatures you control attack, add that much mana to an incumbent of green or red to your mana pool. Until end of turn, you don't lose that mana as steps and phases end. Oh, boys and girls, if we can get enough mana to, to bane fire for lethal effectively. Cool. Okay. I mean, I might just be in green red because that's where my good rares are, right? Like, you know what they say play with your rares. That's not what they say, that's, that's, that's not true at all. Ignore that piece of advice, it is terrible. Judge Sentinels, we've seen. Uh, Voldemort Arcanists are two mana, one through that adds a colourless mana that can be spent on instants and sorceries. Knight of New Banali is a 3 1 for 2, that's an aggressive white card. Seismic Shift to short out land up to two target creatures can't block this turn. Okay. Adventurous Impulse, look at the top of your cards of your library with your creature or land card from one of them and put it into your hand. Green gets one of the best cantrips in the format, once again, because green gets everything. Uh, Dark Bargain, look at the top three cards of your library, uh, put two of them into your hand and the other into graveyard and deal two damage to you. Four mana instant speed to put two out of three into your hand. That seems good. I, 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 what I was, this will see play. This is apparently the creatures that inhabit these swamps of um, Ur Urborg or whatever it's called now. It's Urborg. On Dominaria, they're like weird sort of like fat creature things that are into trading. It's really cool, flavor-wise. Got the skittering nonsense. Battle of Cordia is a four-four-four-four four, four, four that can be kicked to be a seven-seven for eight. Yep, yeah, seems fair enough. Uh, Jousting Lance, that's the equipment that gives plus two plus zero. As long as your turn, it does first strike. That's pretty good for getting in there and just smashing through stuff. If it's a four mana sorcery, destroy target creature, you don't get much more straightforward than that at common. Not quite murder though, is it? <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, we've got the green one in the green land cycle. What this does is it sacrifices to look at top of the card of your library and you reveal a creature card from one and put it into your hand. The rest of the bottom of your library in a random order. Look at this beautiful, thick, fupa holding, sensual phallid. Oh, I mean, it really is the phallids right now. They're, they're really cool. Tetsuko Umazawa, Fugitive. This is uh, the guy who owned Umazawa's Jitte. This is like his descendant. They're the family that actually managed to banish Nicol Bolas at one point or another. So this guy is hiding from Nicol Bolas. And you can see he's hiding like a doorway to another like dimension. Maybe plane shifting or, or something. Uh, creatures you control with power or toughness one or less can't be blocked. So he makes Thopters unblockable. And we've got a second... Oh, God. Oh, second founded. Um, We've got another... <laughs> Another Jaya's Immolating Inferno. So we are going to be playing these. We're going to play in some combination of red. What I will do is, I'm not going to build the deck in the video today. What I will do is I will skim over my deck and tell you about my choices in the video that's going up tomorrow or Thursday where me and John will play some magic. So, let's have a look at the rares we opened and have a quick recap of what we got. So, we opened two promos that are red. We opened Rarix, Bladewing, and Jaya's Immolating Inferno. And then we opened another Jaya's Immolating Inferno. So we might be in red. It's not guaranteed. We could have absolutely no support for it. I can't actually recall opening that many good red creatures. But that's what our secondary colour can fill in for creatures. We've got a Grand Warlord Radath, 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 sorry, which is um, a, a creature that manages to pump us full of mana. And it's also a 3 4 pace for 4, so it's not bad at all. We also opened um, a Gilded Lotus that can ramp us into a better version of this. We also opened, which is also historic, so we can... Oh no, is this historic? No, we need a legendary creature or planes, so we need legendary creatures to be able to play this. Uh, we've got a Territorial Allosaur, which is not legendary, but it's a good green card. And we might be smashing black, I guess, maybe, for cool cards like this. But probably not, because splashing is a bad idea. We've got the Blade as well, which is not legendary either, but it helps with making creatures aggressive. So that's our rares. What I would normally do at a pre-release now, I've got these bomby cards here that I'm going to keep out, is I would get all my cards and I'd pile them to different colours. So I'm going to do that very quickly now. Once you have your cards in their respective piles of colour, you can then start looking through for cards you think are good enough. Because what you might find is that certain colours might look deep because there's a lot of cards for them, 
and then you will look through that colour and realise that actually only three or four of the cards are even remotely playable. If you struggle to figure out what cards are playable or any good, please just ask. Have a chat to people around you, make some friends and, and talk about magic. If you don't want to do that, then maybe the pre-release probably isn't the best place for you because it's a very fun social environment for the most part. I am now going to look through my cards and build a deck, but I'm not going to do that on the camera. No, 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 no. That's a surprise for tomorrow's video. So if you liked this video, if you enjoyed the small insight into this, then please like the video. Drop me a comment below telling me um, if you liked what I opened and what you would build with this deck. Tell me if I've missed anything that you think is actually an absolute bomb and limited or just very, very good otherwise. And drop that in the comment section below to help me build my deck better than John will tomorrow so I can smash him. In, in the metaphorical sense, not literally, I'm not going to smash off his head in with like a, like a claw hammer, that'd be, that'd be not very nice. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe and comment, and I'll see you guys tomorrow or Thursday for some Dominaria gameplay. Ta-ta for now. <laughs>